So how many of you guys, okay, love Christmas songs? Let me see your hands. Love Christmas songs. How many of you hate them? Okay. Okay. Let's, let's talk for a second. Let's talk about secular Christmas songs. What is your favorite Christmas song? Let's hear it. Jingle Bells, which is not even a Christmas song. If you hear the history of it, it's another. What was that? Rudolph. Rudolph okay. Secular Christmas song. Good one. My, you know what, my, my, what's her name? Mariah Carey, I, I try to hate that song. I can't help it, I like that song. Some people hate it, I don't care, I love that song. Another one, Rudolph, what's that? Silver Bells, okay. Uh, Little Saint Nick by the Beach Boys. We got specifics here, this is awesome. In the first service, some lady in the back goes, Grandma got ran over by a reindeer. It was awesome. It was awesome. Okay, okay. Now let's go to the Jesus Christmas songs. And uh, what are your favorite Jesus Christmas songs? Let's hear from you. Silent Night. Silent Night. Oh, Holy Night. Oh, Holy Night. I, I got to tell you, that's my favorite. Right there. You get somebody that knows how to sing, not me. But that song is amazing. Okay, somebody else? Who, who, who is this child? What child is this? What, go ahead. Hark the Herald Angel Sings. Drummer Boy. Joy to the World. Okay, we, let, let me, let me, th- these songs, many of the songs, we sing them every year, Christmas songs. Okay, we got to do them. And we, we run through these songs and we are not even hardly paying attention to them many times. This morning we sang a song, Hark the Herald Angel Sings. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. L- l- listen to the words of this. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. I preached on that last week, didn't I? We we looked at God leaving the throne room of heaven and coming down in the incarnation of Christ. Pleased as man with men to dwell. He came here, God became a man. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Now, that is incredible theology. And I want to encourage you guys to when we're singing these Christmas songs, man, just focus. I know you know the words, but there is rich, that, that there is some good theology, right? So this morning, what I want to do is I want to, to preach my message and focus in on a lesser known Christmas song. This song was actually written by a a young teenage girl, maybe as young as 13 and maybe as old as 17. And it's recorded in the scriptures. It's a song that Mary, the mother of Jesus, wrote or sang. And I'd like us to to focus in on it this morning. And she's writing from her own personal experiences. You know how songs, they always seem to flow best out of personal experience. Uh, Mary's personal experience was pretty raw. Let me show you what it was. I got it here. She was a poor, powerless, teenage, engaged, pregnant virgin who was going to be responsible for raising the Savior of the world. What could possibly go wrong, right? This is a mess. Now, just so you know, an angel had appeared to Mary and said that she was going to be the, the mother of the Savior. And uh, Mary's like, how can this be? I am a virgin. And this, the angel says, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to overpower you, overcome you rather, and you're going to give birth to this Son of God, Jesus, who's going to save the world. And Mary's like, I don't, how can this happen? And, and, and the angel says, with man things are impossible. With God nothing is impossible. And so Mary... Mary's like, okay, I hear that uh, my Elizabeth family member is pregnant. And so she runs over and she says, is it true that I'm really going to be the mother of, of the Savior of the world? And Elizabeth says, yeah, Mary, you, it's true. You're going to be. As a matter of fact, she, Elizabeth was pregnant herself. She says, matter of fact, when you came in the room, my baby in my womb jumped. And this, you are going to be the mother of the Savior of the world. So out of this incredible backdrop... Mary writes a song, sings a song. If you have your Bibles, it's in Luke chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up in verse 46. It says this. 
And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Wait. Did we, did we, did we miss something there? She's a pregnant virgin. She is poor. She's a teenager. She's powerless. She has to figure out how to raise the Savior of the world. That's the drop backdrop. And she sings this song, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That doesn't seem real to me. Does it seem almost unreal to you that somebody in that mess could sing this song? So this morning, I want to, together with you, explore a question. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. It's this. How can we praise the Lord and rejoice in God this Christmas season, even if we don't feel like it? How do you praise the Lord when the circumstances in your life give you no reason at all to praise the Lord? Now, as I begin this morning's message, before I get into my outline, uh, I, I want to tell you three, about three burdens I have that have led me to this, preach this message. And the first burden is this. Everyone doesn't have the Christmas spirit just because we're in the Christmas season. Amen? Um, when I was younger and a whole lot less mature, I, I mean, I love Christmas. I thought it was the greatest thing, and I love the, the music and all the trappings, all the fun stuff, the lights, the, the, the music, the, the, the dinners, the desserts, all that stuff. And I would see people on occasion who kind of had a humbug kind of attitude. They were going through tough times, and I would, in my immaturity, think, come on, suck it up, buttercup. You know, this is Christmas. And yet as years have gone by and, and life has been hard on me like it is on hard on you, I understand oftentimes that not just because it's Christmas doesn't mean everybody has the Christmas spirit. And I understand those that are hurting. And I hope and I pray that Hessel Church will continue to be a place that is sensitive to the fact that many of us deal with circumstances that make it really hard to praise the Lord. And how many of you are thankful for the fact that God's okay with you having those feelings of not feeling like praising Him, right? Because sometimes we just don't. Now, some of you say, well, I just, I want to praise the Lord all the time. And and I'll tell you, well, you're better than me because that's not how I always feel. Here's the second burden I have. For many people, the Christmas season intensifies feelings of loss, loneliness, pain, and failure. Uh, At Christmas time, you gather around the tree, you gather with family, and there's there's many times there's somebody that's not there. They they may have been there last year or the year before, a couple years before, but it's a reminder. Many times you gather around, everybody's having fun, and there's so much joyousness and happiness, and yet... A lot of your goals are not being achieved and what you had hoped and dreamed about are not real. And so you feel some intense feelings of loss. Some of you during this last year have lost somebody through divorce. Some of you have lost somebody through just a relationship fracture or even through death. And and you gather there and you go, you know, it's just not the same. It's not as much fun as it used to be. Here's here's the third burden I have. It's much easier to magnify our mess than our Messiah. And really, this is what I want to talk about this morning. It is so easy to to look down here at our mess. And we look at our, our marriage is not where it should be. Our finances are certainly not where they should be. Everybody else's family looks so much happier than ours. Our family's a mess. My job, our career is not where I... Just, and we, we can magnify the mess rather than magnify the Messiah. 
honestly, there's been times in my life, Lori, in my life, that it has been hard to magnify the Lord and not our mess. We've gone through Christmases, and years ago, many of you know our story, we went through years and years of infertility, and all of our friends were having babies like crazy, and it was just this awesome thing, you know? And, and, and we'd get together with family, and then, you know, kids are grand, our, our nieces and nephews are running around, and it's just like, okay, we're like, we don't have it, right? And you feel kind of like, I don't fit. There, there was, uh, on December the 19th, 1996, my dad went home to be with the Lord. And that Christmas, five days later, there was somebody pretty big in my life that was missing. We, we've gone through Christmases when our own children, who were teenagers and going through some diff, very difficult things, they were going crazy. And I'll, I'm going to tell you something. It, there was not a lot of joy. It was pretty messy. So as I preach this this morning, I want you to understand, I, I get what you might be feeling this morning. My question, first off, I want to say to those of you that are, you do have a life that's messy right now. I am not saying that your mess is not as big as it actually is. My, my question is, is simply, are you magnifying the mess? Or are you magnifying the Messiah and what he has done for you? R. Kent Hughes says this, Of course God cannot be made any bigger, magnified. But he can be enlarged in one's life. We, can magna- we magnify or enlarge God when we take into thinking some of the aspects of his greatness. So this morning, I want to give you my outline, what I'm going to do. Here it is. You got to repeat it back to me. Two, three, one. What's my outline? Okay. There it is. Let's go home. No, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Let's take a look at this passage. The first thing we're going to look at are two components of Mary's praise. Two components of Mary's praise. Verse 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. There's two components of her praise. What are they? You guys are all theologians, man, that you crushed it. It did not hurt that I underlined them, did it? Okay, soul in the Greek is the Greek word where we get psyche. It it speaks of, of, of who you are. It, it, it speaks of your mind and, and who you really are. The, the word spirit is the Greek word pneuma, and it is actually the deepest part of you that relates to God. It's that spiritual connection with God. And so he, listen, listen again to what Kent Hughes says. He says this, soul and spirit simply refer to the inner self, the I. This combination is a powerful, emotive way of saying my total self. All that I am magnifies and praises the Lord. Now, I want you to stop for a moment and think of the, look at this and, and contrast that with how you and I tend to magnify our problems. We think about them all the time. We got problems, we talk, we think about them, we talk to our friends about them, we, we, we text our friends, we, 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 we talk to God about them, and that is what we've got, all these problems. And that is, that's the total self. We, we know how to do total self. We can do total self magnifying the problem. But what... what Mary does is she says, I'm going to give my total self to praise. Now, I'm going to talk to you men here for a moment. We know how to do total self. We get so passionate about fantasy football and the sports page. We get excited about our hobbies. We, we get excited about our retirements and our, the stock market. Man, listen, I'm not against these. But I am against you and me giving our, 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 our soul and spirit to a lot of things that are not eternal. Now, ladies, I was going to mess with you, but I don't even have time for you this morning. Actually, I do. Yeah, you know, 
Women, I'm going to tell you, you, many of you are tremendous moms, but it is so easy to just go, man, it's all about my kids. It's all about my family. So, So we know how to do total self. We know how to focus in on things that are not God. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. To magnify God's greatness and grandeur fully, we must engage our mind and spirit completely. Some of us say, well, I am more of a mind guy. I love the Word of God. I love the Scriptures. They're tremendous. Oh, I want to learn about uh, end time stuff, eschatology. I want to learn about theology. I'm a mind guy. And there's nothing wrong with that. But many times that same person will say, I'm a mind person, but I don't have much life or fire in my bones at all for a relationship with God. It's all about mind. Other people come over here and they go, I'm more of a spirit person. I, I mean, I, I don't care about that so much. I just sing a song. I don't know if it's theologically true or not. I just sing a song. And one chorus of you're a good, good father. And, oh, you've got me, right? And the Bible says we are to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We're to do both. And that's what Mary does. Her total self. In her mess, she's going to start to magnify God. That was our first point. Two components of Mary's praise, spirit and soul. Here's the here's second point on my outline. Three aspects of God's greatness. Take a look. Three aspects of God's greatness. The first one is this. She magnifies God's eyes. Well, you say, Rich, what are you talking about? Take a look here in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. It says this. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has, what's the next word say? That's right. Looked on the humble estate of his servant. Mary says, I magnify God's eyes who are looking. The word actually means gazing intently on me. I'm a humble person. I'm not much to look at. Look at verse 48, it continues, For behold, now from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary says, listen, I magnify God. He's looked upon me in this Humble estate, I'm not much, I'm broken, I'm powerless, I'm a, I'm a pregnant teenage virgin. And, he's, and he, his eyes are on me. Now, in this, I want you to know something. Ma- Mary, we, we know that our Catholics' friends, they like to much, make much of Mary. And I think as, as Protestants, many times we, we, we put them down, but I'm going to tell you, we should always respect Mary Mary was a godly woman who really uh, embraced and even in, in the song magnifies the Lord. But I want you to understand something, that Mary doesn't talk about anybody magnifying her. If you look, look back at verse 49, she says, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is, she doesn't say my name. I want you to see that. She says holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Listen, the emphasis that Mary puts, her, her, what she's magnifying is not herself, it's the Lord. Let me, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm going to just be honest. I believe that if Mary could see how some people have elevated and magnified her over the Lord, I think it would break her heart. She says, Holy is the Lord. That's her focus. We need to not pray, praise Mary and pray to Mary. We need to praise and pray to the person that Mary praises and prays to. Magnify Almighty God. Mary's eyes and focus. Is on God whose eyes are on her. 
And she's not much to look at. She's, she's a broken gal. Let me read to you for what Jesus says about this. He says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Psalm 34, 18, he says this, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So, for those of us at this Christmas season who feel crushed and broken, here's a verse that promises that the Lord is near to us. Let me give you an application. God's eyes, God sees and values the lowly, the humble, and overlooked. I, I love this. Let's just stop for a second. I love this. Ma- Mary accepts God's plan for her life. Trust me, this is not what she had envisioned. This is what she's going through right now is not something that she had dreamed about or even could imagine. She was thinking that on her wedding day, everybody would be so excited, gathered around. It was going to be a grand wedding day. And then in time when she got pregnant, she would share her pregnancy with other people and everybody in the community would rejoice and be grateful for her. For her. But that plan went away. And God, and God says, no, let me give you the best plan. And right now, we're in the mess, right? We go, this is a mess. And, and Mary gives us a great example. She says, yeah, it's a mess. But God's eyes are on me. And this is part of his plan. And God's purpose and plan will not be thwarted because I'm in a mess. His eyes are on the brokenhearted. His eyes... But some of you today need to hear this because... Your plan is out the window. You're dealing with a reality that is quite different. You had goals. You had plans. They're gone. Mary shows us. She says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Will you just look in his eyes? His eyes never come off of me. Are you magnifying your problems, your brokenness, your circumstances? Or the fact that God's eyes are on you? And that His plan will not be thwarted. For those of you who are saying here today, well, <laughs> praise God, I'm not, I'm not humble or lowly like Mary. I, you know, I've got my life kind of together. I just want to say to you, yikes. One of the things that Scripture tells us is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I have a question for you. Not poor in spirit. Have you become middle class in spirit? Where you really don't need God much, because you're not poor in spirit, you, you really need, you're, you're middle class. It's okay, I mean, God's answering your prayers. And you're proud that you aren't where you used to be, you've gotten a lot better, and so you're kind of middle class in spirit. Let me share with you as your pastor and your friend, I don't ever want to be not lowly. The Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Lord, keep me lowly. Keep me humble for all my life. And Lord, if you ever do answer my prayers, may you remind me that that's only your grace and you can take those things away from me that you gave me. And I want to remain lowly, humble in spirit, Mary says, man, yeah, it's messy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at the fact that God's eyes are on me, the lowly. And then she says, okay, not, not only am I going to look at that, here's the second thing she focuses on, and that is this, God's arms. She, she focuses on his eyes, and now look at her, what she says, what she does when she looks at her, his arms in her song. What's it look like? 
Look at it, verse 51. He has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. God's arms, Mary says, are powerful. God in the past, she knew her history. God in the past had toppled great leaders like Nebuchadnezzar, had toppled great leaders like the Egyptian pharaoh. And he had elevated, exalted, humble widows dealing back in Elijah's day. And she says, yeah, our God is powerful. He can take down the mighty. He can, he can raise up the humble. And Mary says, I can have confidence. I can have confidence that regardless of what people may say about this poor pregnant virgin, regardless of how uncertain the future is, my God is faithful. His arms are strong. And my God's arms are strong enough to handle whatever I'm experiencing right now. So, so again, are you, are you magnifying that you have no power to change the situation that you find yourself in right now or that God is in control and in due time? He'll raise up the humble. Look at verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. What he's talking about is those who have, are full of things other than God will one day be cast aside and that those who hunger for righteousness, hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Jesus put it this way. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst you. So what is he saying? Hey, your life is a mess? If you come to me, you'll not leave hungry. You, you won't leave thirsty. I'll give you the food. I'll give you the drink. Here's the application for God's arms. God empowers the powerless and will eventually triumph over the powerful. And you and I can rest in this. Years ago, when, uh, when I was going through a difficult time in my life, uh, I, I'd meet regularly with two other friends of mine, and we would work out together, and we would read Scripture together. And there was a passage of Scripture that I've read before, but it never meant anything to me. I was going through some really rough stuff in my life, and, uh, and I came across this, this passage. It's Psalm 131, verse 2. I want to I read it to you. The psalmist says, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Now, just imagine this, okay? You know what it looks like? Here's a child, maybe toddler age, climbs up in his mom's lap, his tummy's full, and he just does this. He rests. He, he's not responsible for holding any part of him up. He just rests. And the psalmist says, oh, that's, that's the goal. Can I tell you something? When I'm going through messy stuff, this thing tends to elude me. I don't like thinking like that. But can we rest in a God who's all-powerful? The answer is yes. That, that child is like this. Not worried about his next meal. April 15th means nothing to him. And he's just... That's a picture of what God wants for you. Whatever the mess, that we just rest. And why can we do that? Because the Bible says he's strong enough to handle it. He, 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 can, he can deal with whatever we're dealing with. So Mary says, I am, I'm not magnifying the mess. I'm going to magnify my God. I'm going to look at his arm, his, his, his eyes. They're always on me. And his arms, they're strong enough to take me through this trial that I'm going through. And it's significant. It's hard. 
And here's the third one. I'm going to focus in on God's memory. God's memory. Look at what uh, verses 45 and 40, 44, 54 and 55 say. Mary says this, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. See, what Mary's talking about is that God had made a promise to Abraham thousands of years before. In, in Genesis chapter 12, God had said to Abraham, Abraham, in you... All the nations of the world will be blessed. It was a promise that God made. God made a promise thousands of years before. And the ultimate answer, fulfillment of that promise was Jesus coming to earth, being born through a virgin, living a life, and dying for us on the cross. That was the fulfillment. And Mary says, this God that we are looking at here remembers promises. He keeps his promises. The promises that Abraham made had been made thousands of years before. It's interesting because just right before this passage, an angel had appeared to Joseph. And in, in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, listen to what the angel said. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she'll bear a son, and you'll call, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will, what's the word? Save. Save his people from their sins. And Mary is saying, okay, it's a mess. But God's eyes are on me. His arms are big enough to handle. And he keeps his promises. He's not going to renege on any of them. When was the last time that in your mess you just praise God for the promises He's made to you? I was having a little bit of fun looking at passages of Scripture in my preparation for this and thinking about all the promises that God has made. And let me just grab grab a few, share with you a few rather. Hebrews 13, 5 is amazing. Jesus is speaking and he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So my eyes upon you and only my eye on you. But let me just tell you something. I'm not leaving your side. Look at what Romans 8, 28 says. Many of us know this. All things work together for what? For what? Good. It doesn't feel good. It may not be good right now. But God's got good in store. All things work together for good to those who are called according to His purpose. Philippians 4, 19, another, my God, Paul says, will will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You're getting weary of the mess. You're getting feeling hopeless of the mess. You don't know what to do in the mess. You know what? God says, I'm going to meet all your needs. You need whatever you need. I've got it covered. And Mary says, I'm going to magnify that one. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the God who began a good work in you will complete it, will bring it, excuse me, will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. But Rich, I don't know if I can stand it. This is so painful. In 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 9, Jesus makes this promise. Might as well have made it to you because it's in the Word of God and it's for you. My grace is enough. My grace is enough for you. My grace is sufficient for you for my power, Christ's power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here, there's something that you can apply to your life. God's memory. God remembers his promise to save. Whatever you're going through, he he promises to save. So let me wrap it up. Here's the summation of it. I'm going to put it on the screen. God's eyes look on the lowly, humble, and overlooked. That could be you this morning, right now. 
You're dealing with your parents that are challenging. You're dealing with your kids that are challenging. You're dealing with your own health that's challenging. You're dealing with your, your marriage that's challenging. You're dealing with finances, that, whatever it is. You just feel lowly. And like the rest of the world's going on without you, and you're all alone. God's eyes look on the lowly, humble and overlooked. His arms over, empower the powerless. That's me. I need his power because I don't have it. And God's memory remembers his promises to save. If you are magnifying your, your marriage, if you're magnifying that problem, your health, your loss, you're magnifying the wrong thing. I, I, by the way, I'm, I'm not telling you that this is not real. I'm not telling you your mess is not painful. But I have to tell you this, it may not be, this may be painful, but God is bigger. He's greater. So we have a choice. Are we going to magnify the mess? Or are we going to magnify God? So we had three, two, one. Here's the one. One reasonable response. There's only one. And that's magnify God. Make much of Him. Yes, your circumstances are real, but magnify God's eyes, His arms, His memory. So the question is, will you magnify your mess or magnify the character of God? Will you just bow your heads and close your eyes? This is the time that I would want to encourage you to respond. You've heard the word of God communicated, and now we all get to, to choose. You, right? For most people who are in a mess, nobody had to tap you on the shoulder and whisper in your ear what your mess is. You know what it is. You know the disappointments of life. You know where your heart is. You know that. And now you get to make a choice. What are you going to magnify right now? Not just through the Christmas season, but in life. And so I want you to just talk to the Lord about that. If you're here this morning and, and you don't have a mess, praise God. Just pray that God would keep you lowly in spirit, dependent upon Him. Just pray for people around you who are just broken right now. Lord, in the midst of the mess, today, we choose to magnify your eyes. Nothing's in our, in our brokenness that has been missed by you. you. Your eyes are on us. And your purpose and plan for us will not be thwarted. We magnify your arms that are strong, able to take down kingdoms and raise up poor broken people and we magnify your memory that every promise that you've ever made to us you keep and so today we choose to magnify you in Jesus name amen thank you for watching Hessel Online be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest content and share this with a friend if you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and may God bless you.